Okay, so um, so I'm Gary Howell. I run an uh, IT company called Morgan Walsh in Pembrokeshire. And uh, over the last uh, year or so, actually longer, but um, um, more recently, I've been involved with uh, some of the councils across Wales, uh, also uh, local town, Cardigan Town. Uh, and I also uh, are currently helping um, uh, Farming Connect with some of their farming projects with regards to sensors on the farms. Uh, so uh, Gareth's asked me to uh, give some examples of some of my work in this area. So uh, this is my talk straight from the front line. So uh, hopefully it'll be informative. So the uh, first thing that uh, I'd like to talk about is uh, street bin management. Um, and, and a lot of these examples come from towns as uh, I'm, I'm working with the councils on those particular centres. Uh, so uh, bins, as I'm sure you, you know from your own local community, uh, often overflow, uh, particularly on a, a Friday or Saturday night. You know, people go to the chip shop and uh, uh, put rubbish in the bin, which gets full really quickly. And then what happens is the rubbish starts to overflow. And then once uh, other people see rubbish on the floor, they just think it's OK to throw rubbish on the floor. And so it just the problem just gets worse and worse. And uh, the, again, the problem with bins is that uh, often they are uh, scheduled to be picked up sometime during the week, maybe if you're lucky twice a week, but probably not on a Sunday. So uh, this is detrimental to the area. We start getting uh, rodents uh, and potentially disease around the bins. And it's just not a nice place to be around. Um, this also has an economic uh, problem in that if people come to a town and all the bins look like this, uh, then they don't want to come back to that town again. So it's definitely worth trying to sort out uh, just simple you know, bin emptying without going over the top in terms of costs. So uh, what's been implemented here is uh, on the left you have a standard street bin which has got some holes in the side to put the rubbish in. And then the sensor is mounted inside the lid just above those holes, so it's essentially out of sight. And then there's a, a beam which goes down, either, either ultrasonic or a, a laser, uh, which shines down on the rubbish and then measures the distance between the top of the bin and where the rubbish has got up to. Uh, that information is then sent via the uh, LoRaWAN network to, uh, through the Things network and ends up on a dashboard. Uh, so here we have a dashboard from Tego.io, which is one of the ones we normally use. Um, and on here we have uh, six bins. And as you can see, uh, the plush chips bin outside and also the bus depot are quite full. Uh, perhaps not surprisingly, because there's a lot of people around those areas. And then the town council and uh, college car park bins are over half full. So they sort of on a, on a watch list of orange. And then the bin around the, ca the uh, castle and um, uh, the uh, car park are quite low. And they're in green. So the uh, offshot of this is that someone looking at this, whether it's uh, the team uh, managing the bins or the local town council, can see what's actively happening in their bins uh, several times a day. And the system is set up so that when the bin gets over a certain level, uh, so basically when it goes red here, uh, an alert is uh, sent out either via email or text uh, or via the app. Uh, so that the person who is monitoring this stuff gets alert, actively alerted to say these bins are getting full and they can then take the appropriate action. So here, that uh, if we see that uh, the chip bin is getting uh, quite full uh, towards a, a Saturday night, uh, then it's quite possible uh, the person responsible for emptying the bins in that town uh, sends out uh, uh, someone to empty just the plush bins and the bus, bus depot bin on a Monday and they leave the regular uh, scheduling empty for later on in the week. Uh, but it just means that, as, as I mentioned, in terms of uh, keeping the town clean, uh, this sort of system is, is uh, useful for alerting the person responsible. Um, just a note on uh, dashboards and, and apps. Uh, one of the uh, problems that I see is that uh, sensor data arrives uh, in an app and often people are forced to log in using a website and they have to remember their username and password. And because it's made difficult in that respect, people just don't look and the data is all here and all the information they need to do their job or to improve things in, a, in an area is available to them, but it's just a pain to access and so they just don't do it. So uh, certainly uh, if and when you choose a dashboard to use, uh, you should ensure that there is an app uh, available on your phone, uh, either Android or Apple. Uh, to, so that the dashboard that you see here in the middle of the screen can be replicated on your phone on the, on the right. Um, another advantage of having an application on the phone is that alerts come through straight away, like a text, uh, similar to a text, uh, but they're actually driven by the data that arrives. 
so in Peter's case, um, if this was the, the rat trap, then his app uh, on Tega can basically send a message to say, hey, Pete, you got caught a rat, and then he can then take the appropriate action either straight away or, or schedule it when he's passing. So some of the advantages or benefits of the, the bin monitoring for the towns that I've worked with are cleaner streets because bins are being emptied more often and, and in a more efficient way. So this leads to lower emissions from the vehicles uh, because they're spending less time on the road and they're more focused, which ultimately leads to reduced costs for the council, which is good. And probably equally importantly is the kudos that the, uh, for the community uh, for the, and the council because the community then sees that the council are managing the bins more efficiently, there isn't rubbish all over the place, and it's encouraging uh, visitors to come to the town because it's a nice place, clean place to go. Uh, so there's just from one sensor in each bin, uh, there, it, this, there's quite a lot of benefits here, including financial benefits. So uh, you could, I'm sure the accountants can definitely do the maths and figure out that the cost of installing these uh, actually is, is far outweighed by the financial benefits overall to the town. The uh, second uh, uh, test case that we did is actually uh, more close to the home. Uh, my wife uh, runs a leatherwork training business, so people come along and make a handbag or rucksack for the weekend. And uh, we've taken on a new unit down at... Um, now, we're not there very often. We're only there during course times, perhaps uh, once or twice a month and a couple of times during the week. But a lot of the time, the unit's empty. So we need to be uh, happy that the unit is safe, and so is our, our stock. So some of the things that we're trying to ensure uh, that we know about are things like water leaks. So we obviously have a toilet and a, a sink, you know, a kitchen area there. So water leaks are definitely possible. Uh, we need to keep an eye on temperature and humidity uh, because uh, leather is a product that can uh, diminish and go mouldy, particularly with high humidity. So that's really important to us. Uh, theft uh, and detection of theft. So I'll come back to that. And then the rodent control, which Peter demonstrated with uh, with the mouse trap. Uh, I couldn't find a dirty rat. That's probably the cutest mouse I, mouse I could have found. So uh, 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 it's, that's good. So um, as they say, uh, for all of these things, uh, there's a sensor for that. So uh, with the water leak, uh, we use a simple sensor from uh, Netvox. Uh, and as you can see on the, on the far left, there's two small little boxes. And these are the sensors which essentially are glued or uh, stuck to the floor. And uh, if there's then a water leak, the water flows under the sensors. So obviously, the positioning is important, so by the sink or just under the sink. Uh, and as soon as water is detected, the uh, sensor uh, sends an alert out to, via the Things Network, which arrives in the control panel and therefore on my phone, and says there's now a water leak. So we can take immediate action as soon as we know that's happened. As far as the temperature goes, it's fairly straightforward, temperature and humidity. So we can set limits as to if humidity goes above you know, 60 or 70%, then we want to know about that. We may not rush down there, but at least we know it's becoming a problem for our, our leather product. But one of the advantages of this particular sensor uh, is it also monitors CO2 levels. So uh, as a training organization, it's really important, particularly as we deal with uh, people with uh, using our knives to cut leather, uh, that they're fairly alert, uh, or very alert when they're using knives, but also that they're paying attention uh, through uh, the, you know, their brains working normally with, with decent levels of oxygen. So if we know that uh, CO2 levels are getting high, and quite often they get high before it gets stuffy in the room, when someone says, oh, can you just open the window, please? Uh, then we, we can uh, essentially uh, actively manage the CO2 levels in the building uh, and allow uh, our students to have a better uh, time, and they're more alert to us in terms of teaching. Uh, so that improves our teaching environment and they get more benefits. So that's a great advantage to us as a business. Now the theft one is interesting. Uh, what we've done in this unit is we put a unit, uh, a, a detector on the door, which detects when the door is simply open or closed. Um, and we did get an alert which was unexpected, uh, and I investigated of course. And it turned out that um, I, there's a, I also have a camera which just records uh, when there's some movement in the, in the building. So I looked at the footage and what had happened was the building management uh, person had uh, entered our building without permission, uh, and but what they were doing us a favour, they were just dropping something off, which is fair enough, but we didn't know about it. And so uh, I took this up with the management company and they said, yeah, yeah, you're right, they shouldn't have come in without giving you a call. So that, that was fine, so that was all sorted out, but we wouldn't have known, that was the point really. Uh, and uh, of course, if we get an alert in the middle of the night, it's probably someone who's broken in. Uh, and we'd really want to know about that. So we may not be able to prevent the theft if it's just an opportunist, uh, but at least we can raise the, the alert with the police and, and uh, potentially go down ourselves. 
uh, and this is just a simple sensor on the door. So in terms of cost here, the sensor on the door is about £50, the water leak tent is about £70, uh, temperature I think is about 80 or so. So for less than £200 uh, plus a mousetrap, uh, then it's, it's a really cheap way of doing it. Uh, now, in, we talked earlier about, or Peter talked about coverage and it's getting better, and uh, certainly I'm really pleased with the gateway rollout in Caradigion because we're approaching in certain areas sort of wall-to-wall -wall coverage of Lorawan, which gives businesses uh, opportunities to add sensors essentially free of charge. So previously, these sort of sensors would have had a SIM card in, they would have been much larger, you'd need to keep charging them up. With LoRaWAN, they last years, there's no ongoing costs because there's no SIM in them. Uh, and it allows uh, you to add sensors without worrying about the ongoing cost. So there's great benefits there. So just to summarize, uh, the uh, installed in these uh, items, uh, these sensors within our uh, unit, uh, they were easy to implement, uh, low cost, uh, both in terms of purchase and also running costs. And most importantly for us is the peace of mind to know that the building is secure and that uh, the products that we have in our uh, unit are not going to go off uh, or in, in our case go moldy. The nice thing about uh, the Things Network and using uh, control panels which you're in control of or have someone do them for you uh, is that they're expandable. So if we decided to uh, install um, uh, a freezer with ice cream in it, just a small one for our customers, we can just buy another sensor uh, put it in the freezer and we can monitor the temperature of that as well. Um, and I've, I've got a real life example of, of uh, freezers where actually uh, um, in uh, schools where uh, we weren't using LoRaWAN back then but the temperature of the freezer which is the walk-in freezer in a school uh, needs to be monitored uh, and often they just go in with a temperature gauge uh, or have one in there and they just take the reading uh, every few hours when there's someone at the school but to have monitoring available when there's no one there is a big advantage. So what we found was in the middle of the summer holidays when the, no one should have been in school, we noticed the door had been opened on the uh, freezer, walk-in freezer, and the temperature was rising. Uh, so uh, essentially things were starting to defrost. Uh, and then uh, we, uh, so we, we, we got in touch with the, um, uh, the guy who does the maintenance on the building he went round and what had happened was the uh, contractors were doing some electrical work somewhere else in the building. They'd actually turned off the electric, which they would need to do, of course, but uh, they'd left it off. Uh, so the uh, maintenance guy turned it back on and it would only been a few hours, so everything was okay in terms of temperature. But when you think about the implications of that, the uh, you could have had a complete freezer of meat defrosted or part worse, partly defrosted, so you wouldn't necessarily know refrozen and then feeding that to one and a half thousand kids in school. So this sort of stuff does have real world implications um, and it, def it does happen but often, it's quite often you just don't know. Third, footfall monitoring. Uh, so this is a really hot topic in terms of uh, get getting the uh, you know, regeneration of uh, some towns uh, back, back on track and also to monitor how things are going as improvements are made. So with uh, footfall monitoring, there's several ways of doing it. And the one devices that we use are these uh, beam breaking type sensors. So essentially you s install a pair of these, one either side of a door, and they talk to each other through an infrared beam. So when you walk through the door, uh, the beam gets broken in one direction. So the system knows that someone has entered the building or entered the shop. And then when you leave, uh, the reverse happens and they know you've left. So this has several benefits. One is that you know uh, how many people have been in that facility, whether it's a post office or a shop or, a, or the bank, uh, during the day and over time. So you can do some trends, trend analysis. But you also know at the current times we need to be really aware of how many people are in that space through due to COVID problems. So because it monitors people going in and out, we know how many people are actually in that shop at the one time. So you could link this to a display to say, uh, no, you can't come in because we've got 20 people in the shop or whatever it happens to be. Uh, but it, it, essentially it's, it's a sort of a free benefit of something which uh, you would put in any, in any case for footfall monitoring. So some of the benefits of this are, uh, you know, in terms of financial benefit, are, are, can be quite great. So if you analyse the footfall count versus takings of the till for each shop and you give access, uh, which you can do through the app, to the um, uh, uh, proprietors of that facility, the shop, uh, then they can do their own analysis, of course, on uh, saying, well, a footfall went up and takings went up, brilliant. But that's not always the case. Uh, sometimes you might have hot weather. So if you bring in hot weather, as I'll show you in a second, uh, into the equation, 
you may find that in hot weather, people are just, they come to town because they, they're out with their family and they're just having a nice time and they're browsing. So the footfall's going up, but actually takings are going down or not, not improving. And you wouldn't necessarily know that through without having this additional information. Um, there also, there's also a potential business opportunity there. So if you find that on a hot day, you've got a, an increased footfall, but less takings or less takings than you expect, you may decide that it's worth installing, say, a freezer of ice cream uh, by the door. So you tempt uh, a mum and her three kids to say, oh, actually, before I leave this shop, which has nothing to do with ice cream, let's have a quick ice cream before we go. And then you uh, increase the revenue from the shop uh, through, and you do this through the knowledge that you know people are coming in and not buying. When you roll that up to the whole town, so sort of you get an overall town performance. So uh, obviously there's some confidentiality in terms of takings, but you don't. You could uh, do it on a percentage basis. So you could say, you know, on this week our takings went up 20% compared to normal. And so if you take that across a whole town, you can start to look at the performance of the town, and then town councils can start saying, okay, well look, we've now reached the point where footfall is not increasing anymore. Why is that? Well, it could be because the park, car parking facilities are always full or not adequate enough. Or you might find in areas like Cardigan uh, that uh, people are parking in the car park and then going for a walk and not going to the town at all. So again, through proving this through statistics, uh, you can actually uh, increase the uh, financial advantage to all this in, in towns, which is what uh, Cardigan's been doing for some time now through a system called uh, Cisco Meraki. Um, as I mentioned, COVID management is uh, a, a, a nice, unfortunate, but nice benefit uh, about this uh, footfall system. Uh, and because all this stuff is recorded, uh, certainly on a daily basis, but uh, often hour by hour, uh, you can start to build up long-term trends and looking at some graphs. So uh, looking at uh, a graph, this one is from Cardigan. Um, we, this is a four-week analysis of uh, visitors uh, during these four weeks. Uh, now, I couldn't quite understand why there was uh, each shape by this, but it turns out the uh, dips there on those particular days are a Sunday. So now we know that, uh, we can, we, it's fairly obvious that shop, a lot of shops are going to be closed, uh, so footfall will be expected to be reduced on Sunday. And if you look at the first week on the left, and then the third and fourth week on the right, you'll see it's relatively uh, static. It's, it's, it's a normal flow of people coming in and out of town. But why have we got this peak on around about the 3rd of June? I don't know. So what I did is I pulled in some temperature data, which I could have got from the temperature sensor in the town itself, uh, but I actually got these from uh, the uh, from the Met Office. Um, and uh, what had happened was from around about 28th of May, we, it was very cold, uh, nearly three degrees, and then we uh, reached a staggering, particularly for Cardigan, temperature of 22 degrees on the 3rd. And as you can see, there's been a general and steady increase of visitors to the area over that week period, uh, at which peaked on the on the 3rd. Uh, actually, I think it's the second, um, uh, which correlated with the highest temperature. Uh, now, this is interesting because it essentially shows an increase of 500 visitors, which is about 25% uh, of visitors to the town during a hot period. What does this mean? Uh, it's difficult for me to say, but in terms of town council, this sort of information can be a uh, real gold dust to know that you know if it's hot or if you have a trend of hot, okay, it might be obvious that people, more people are coming to town. But if you then map this to takings in the area and uh, you know people eating outside, you may find that in hot times, the council needs to be more flexible in terms of having, say, outdoor seating for uh, restaurants so that more people can eat and therefore more money spent in the area. But again, it's really difficult to prove without actually having these type of statistics. Finally, and this is my favourite and one which I think should be uh, increasing uh, due to the uh, gateway rollout, is uh, Alzheimer's patient tracking. So uh, I'm doing some tests uh, myself with some different sensors to find out uh, what it's like to track people using LoRaWAN. Um, so uh, typically um, uh, Alzheimer patients are either uh, in maybe a care home or they may be at home but with uh, visiting carers or family members looking after them. Um, and depending on the state of their condition, they may be uh, not so much allowed, but they may be encouraged to go out on their own to try and get some sort of independence. But obviously there's a worry that they might wander off or forget where they are uh, or hurt themselves. So uh, on the left hand side you can see the uh, GPS tracking device. So in this, which is about an inch and a half uh, wide, is an accurate GPS uh, and of course a LoRaWAN uh, transmitter. So uh, it's attached to my belt or it can be attached to a rucksack, but as long as it's you know, not in your pocket, although it probably just about work, uh, a good signal. So, um, so if you're caring for an Alzheimer's uh, person, 
uh, you say, oh, you're going for a walk, no problem. Uh, you put the, uh, just clip this onto their belt, which has already been charged, uh, and off they go for their walk. So every 15 minutes, the sensor, sorry, 15 seconds, uh, the sensor sends uh, my position back through the LoRaWAN network and ends up in this uh, uh, control, uh, this um, panel in Tago, uh, which I call GPS Tracker. And as you can see from the uh, little dots along the road, it's very accurate. It's actually logged my position along the road and just drawn some lines for convenience between. So anyone watching this app can see where I am at any moment in time. Now on the right hand side, I've deliberately uh, turned left and gone into a field and essentially wandered off course, uh, off my normal walking pattern. And uh, within this app, you can essentially set a line, which is shown with the uh, red, red uh, markings, to show where I would normally walk, which is basically up the road and up the hill. But now I've wandered into a field for some reason, maybe I've seen a bird or something I quite fancy, uh, and uh, I've gone to have a look. Now, from a carer's perspective, as soon as I go across that red line, an alert is raised to say uh, Gary's wandered off track, he doesn't know what he's doing, and, uh, and someone needs to know, and now someone does know. So this is about a mile and a half from my home. Uh, now, fortunately, I'm, I'm able and I did this on purpose, but if not, I may have wandered off, and if this is in a, a town, they may have wandered into a place they shouldn't be, or an, onto a busy road, that sort of stuff. Um, so now the uh, carer or person responsible helping me out can then take some action. They might ring my mobile phone to see whether I'm okay. They might jump in the car and come and find me, and they can do that now because I'm being tracked. But equally, uh, if there was no movement at all, it may indicate that I've actually had a fall and I need some help just because I haven't moved my position. So I've gone for my walk and now I haven't moved for uh, uh, five or ten minutes. Now, of course, it could be that my GPS tracker has fallen on my belt or I've, I've thrown it out. Uh, or it could be that I've had a fall and I need some assistance. So as well as going off track, it also no movement can also be a benefit here. And I'm really excited about this because with things like uh, the project in Karadigion with the council doing um, uh, you know, a mass uh, LoRaWAN gateway rollout, uh, it allows things like this to become a reality with essentially no cost. So again, uh, you have dog trackers from Vodafone that will cost you, you know, £100, uh, probably plus £10, £15 a month just to track your dog. Uh, and uh, and that's the traditional way of doing it. But with wide LoRaWAN coverage, it means that you can essentially do it uh, very cheap. The sensor here is uh, 35, 40 pounds, uh, and you can use a free version of, of uh, Things Network and Tago to do this tracking. Uh, there's definitely an opportunity here, I think, for an organization to uh, take, take this on in terms of providing this as a service to, uh, to care organizations. So I think there's an opportunity there for, for someone. Uh, a couple of things I'd just like to mention towards the end here. Um, with regards to sensors, there are hundreds and hundreds of sensors, and they all do different things. Well, a lot of them do the same thing, like temperature and humidity. A lot of them do very specialised things. So this particular sensor is the one that we used and tested first to uh, for the bin uh, monitoring. So what I've done here is I've uh, glued it into the top of a wheelie bin, uh, and then mark the bin, as you can see on the right-hand side, with the distance. So I, um, by closing the lid, I can then check in what the reading is. I can check that the reading is accurate. And then what I did is I then slowly filled the bin up with uh, various pieces of rubbish and uh, bin bags uh, until it reached a uh, reasonable height, you know, 47 centimetres. And I think the reading was something like 45, 46 centimetres, which is it's good enough. It was accurate enough. The reason there's slight, some, some slight inaccuracy in this case is because rubbish is not flat. Uh, obviously, it bends a bit. It depends what you're looking at. But that's good enough. The thing that I wasn't expecting was I was expecting that uh, the when I filled the rubbish up to the top and closed the lid, I was expecting the reading to be zero, and it wasn't. It was actually reading 20 centimeters, which is actually quite a height. And it turns out this particular sensor uh, has a minimum uh, a distance requirement between the sensor and the thing that it's monitoring, in this case rubbish. Now I didn't know that, um, and had I rolled this out to a whole bunch of wheelie bins across the county, uh, I would be wondering why this bin never registered as full because it's always got uh, tw 12, uh, tw sorry, 20 centimetres of free space and that's not the case. So I would just say that if you're doing, particularly for larger rollouts, and this is uh, really where my focus is with the, uh, with the councils, uh, you need to test these devices before they're rolling out because if, uh, not just uh, bin sensors, but any sensor which uh, you, you want to check, you, know, you want to make sure the temperature and humidity is correct. Uh, before you send it out to an elderly person's home, for instance, for monitoring their, their home. Uh, so sometimes you can come across surprises, and I would just encourage you to at least do some checking and testing, and, and just not expect sensors to come out of the box and just apply and hope they work. 
because uh, even me as, a, as an expert, I, I've come across surprises like this, and now you know, you can deal with it, uh, but you may not know, and then you end up spending more time and money going to figure out why it doesn't work, or worse, you just say, this doesn't work, and then the, you, just, you just don't use it, and that's a waste of money, and it also uh, is not good for the confidence of using LoRaWAN, so uh, that's worth taking on board. And uh, finally, when rolling out sensors and the data they produce, you should really do data collection on purpose. Uh, there's a, I know of a lot of sensors, particularly in the early days when people just want to try it out. So they put a sensor in their greenhouse and uh, or whatever it was, or in their shop or in their freezer. And because it was, they found it difficult to log into the website or they just, they just couldn't be bothered, they just ignored the data. And you've got all this data out there which is doing nothing. Um, to be cost effective, particularly with uh, you know uh, councils uh, with with you know uh, uh, cash problems as well, you need to be as efficient as possible. So sensors should be deployed for a reason, and then that data needs to be analysed, uh, which is easy to do within platforms like Tego, uh, and then to be exploited or used to a beneficial uh, effect, so that uh, uh, everyone basically gains from it. And that's what I have time for from the uh, from the cold front, as it were. So thanks for watching and listening. And if you have any problem questions, uh, please uh, either share them here or get in touch afterwards. Thank you.